only type of counterpoint we will discuss is called first species counterpoint. Species counterpoint is a technique of learning strict counterpoint involving the addition of voices to a melody advancing from simple to more complex harmonies and textures. There are five different species of counterpoint. First species is the simplest. It is a counterpoint in which there is one note in the counterpoint for each note in the cantus firmus. It is also known as simple or note against note counterpoint. It is here that you can really understand where the term counterpoint comes from. You have a given point or note in the cantus firmus above which you compose a new or different point or counterpoint. So there are a bunch of rules that you need to learn in order to write a successful first species counterpoint. There are rules that absolutely, under no circumstances, should ever be broken. These are called hard rules. Then there are rules that aren't quite as important, but you should still try to avoid breaking them. These are called soft rules. As this module progresses, we'll keep track of the hard rules on the side of the screen. In the downloadable materials for this module, you will find a flowchart called How to Write a First Species Counterpoint Above a Given Cantus Firmus. This will provide you with a procedure that you can follow in order to compose a first species counterpoint. Let's try writing an example above a Cantus Firmus and we'll go over each hard rule as we encounter them. Here is a Cantus Firmus. The first hard rule of writing counterpoint is you do not talk about counterpoint. Uh, no, wait, it's um, never alter the notes of the Cantus Firmus given to you. Note a couple of things about the Cantus Firmus. It is written in treble clef and is made up entirely of whole notes, except for the last note value, which is a double whole note. In first species counterpoint, one of the hard rules is that every note value must be a whole note or a double whole note if it's at the end. An easier way to remember this is just to write the exact same rhythm that's in the Cantus in your counterpoint. During the time when counterpoint was first developed, the modern treble and bass clefs did not exist. There were also no bar lines, but for ease of learning, we'll stick to modern notation for our example. The first step on our flowchart is to determine the mode and the final. Look at the first and last tones of the cantus firmus. They are both D. D is the final of the mode. There are no accidentals, which could lead us in the direction of a transposed mode. If we look at the most common modes, we see that the mode with the final of D is the Dorian mode. Another hard rule of counterpoint is to only use the pitches of the current mode. Now we can begin the counterpoint. A hard rule is that the counterpoint must begin on a perfect unison, perfect fifth, or perfect octave above the first cantus firmus tone. This gives us three possible options. I liken the act of writing counterpoint to a type of choose your own adventure. You have several options, but not all of them will lead you to the correct and happy ending. If we choose to begin our counterpoint on a perfect unison, it instantly leads us to problems. If we begin both voices on the same pitch in this example, we back ourselves into a corner where we might write a voice crossing. When writing a counterpoint, you must never cross the voices. There's something very important I forgot to tell you. What? Don't cross the streams. Why? It would be bad. A voice crossing occurs when the counterpoint sounds below the cantus firmus, or vice versa. In this example, the counterpoint is singing a C4, which is lower in pitch than the F4 written in the cantus. It is a hard rule that you should never write a voice crossing. So on our adventure, we should not choose the perfect unison as our opening interval because it is too close intervallically to the cantus and will most likely lead to a voice crossing. Let's try out the other options. Both the perfect fifth and perfect octave are viable options. Neither of these options will overlap nor cross with the next pitch in the cantus. Let's try the perfect fifth and see where that takes us. As you might have noticed already, Writing a counterpoint entails a certain amount of foresight to try to see which problems you might encounter along the way. That ability will be developed the more you perform some trial and error with some examples. The next thing you should do is write the end of the counterpoint. There are many hard rules surrounding the composition at the end of a counterpoint, so it's best to write the end correctly and then work your way into it from the beginning. The first rule is that the counterpoint must end on a perfect unison or a perfect octave.
think back to what you just learned about voice crossing. In this example, if we end on a perfect unison, we encounter the same problem as we did at the beginning, a voice crossing. The only other option is the perfect octave. The next rule concerns the penultimate note of the counterpoint. It must be the leading tone of the mode and must proceed to the final by semitone. This means that in modes that have a lowered seventh scale degree, such as this Dorian mode, the seventh should be raised in the counterpoint to create a leading tone that then progresses by semitone to the final. The last step to ending the counterpoint is to write the third to last note, which should always be the final. So basically, always write pitches that create the solfege do, t, do at the end of your counterpoint. We have now begun and finished the counterpoint. It's time to fill in the pitches in between. As we write each pitch, we will need to be equally concerned about how writing that pitch affects the melody and the harmony. So for each pitch that we write, we will check to be sure that we are not breaking any rules before moving on to the next pitch. Again, we will need to use foresight in order to create a musical contour that leads to the ending we've already written. Here is a completed example. There are some important melodic hard rules to keep in mind when writing your counterpoint. Use only the following melodic intervals. Perfect unison, the major or minor second, the major or minor third, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, diminished fifth, major sixth, only use this one ascending, and the perfect octave. If you write a leap of a fourth or greater, you have to use what's known as the law of recovery. The law of recovery states that for any leap greater than a fourth, you must recover by step in the opposite direction. Just think about what would happen if you exerted yourself by taking a great big long jump. You'd need a second to recover before moving on. In music, you recover by moving by step in the opposite direction. Skips and leaps must account for less than 50% of the total melodic intervals. In this example, there are 10 possible melodic intervals, and we only wrote one skip, so we're good. Harmonically, you should only use the intervals of a major or minor third, perfect fifth, a major or minor sixth, perfect octave, or a major or minor tenth. These are all considered consonant intervals. Any type of fourth, seventh, augmented or diminished interval is considered dissonant and should not be used harmonically. Finally, all perfect intervals should be approached by contrary or oblique motion in order to avoid parallel and hidden perfect intervals. A parallel perfect interval is a succession of two perfect intervals of the same type in parallel motion between the cantus and counterpoint. A hidden perfect interval is similar motion in both voices into a perfect interval. That ends the discussion of all of the hard rules. We will discuss the soft rules in class. If you follow all of the rules, you will end up composing a successful counterpoint exercise that sounds similar to this.